Well, we are continuing our series called Stranger Things, and uh, if you have your Bible and you want to turn to our text, we're going to be using 1 Peter, the first chapter, starting with verse 13 and following. Just give you a little bit of a recap. Peter wrote this letter to a group of Christians in what was called Northern Asia Minor. It's modern-day Turkey. And he wrote this to them because they were under tremendous persecution simply because they were Christians. That was it. And they were taking heat from their pagan neighbors as well as the Roman government. And uh, so they wrote, Peter wrote this letter to them to give them some incentive to keep fighting, keep keep moving forward, keep walking the walk of Jesus. And the first part of the letter, what we talked about last week, Peter kind of emphasizes walking in the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. He focused on that hope. And today he's going to talk about walking in holiness. And it's interesting because holiness and hope are connected in Scripture. We see this in John's letter, 1 John 3, 3. We read this. He says, all who have this hope, and he's talking about the hope in him, that's Jesus, purify themselves just as he is pure. So we're going to talk about holiness today and what what it looks like in order to have enough of all of that you need in order to live a life like that. Now, what does holiness look like to you? You know, for some people, when you use that term, you talk about holiness, they immediately think of, you know, monks in a monastery reading, uh, you know, century-old Bibles by candlelight. Others, when they think about holiness, they think about that moment when their child was born. That was the holiest moment. They were the purest they were, would ever be until they met Jesus. For some, it's a picture of Mother Teresa caring for a dying man in the streets of Calcutta, India. For others, it's Billy Graham preaching a crusade to 1.1 million Koreans in Seoul, South Korea. That's a picture of holiness. What does holiness look like for you? You know, for me, one of the first images that I had of holiness, or at least I felt like this was a picture of holiness, happened to me uh, while visiting Europe shortly after I graduated from high school. While in Austria, we visited a number of these cathedrals. These were these imposing, ominous uh, structures that built hundreds and hundreds of years ago. They were musty smelling and damp feeling. Mostly the mustiness came from the hundreds of years of burning incense in there. You could feel it. You could almost taste it. And it was lit. Most of these cathedrals were lit by the light that came through these ornately beautiful stained glass windows. And for me, at where I was at that point in my life, those cathedrals felt like holy places. What does holiness look like to you? You know, it's interesting that in the uh, root meaning of the word holy, it comes from the word different. A holy person is not an odd person, though the world might think they are. They're not. But they are different than most people. His quality, the person who's holy, has this quality about them that makes them unique. They are different. His present lifestyle is not only different from his past lifestyle, but it's different from most of the people who live in this world who do not believe in God. They don't live for God. And thus, his life and the style of their life are very, very different. In fact, sometimes they're at odds. The challenge with holiness is simply this. It is not easy to live in this world and to maintain a holy life. It is not easy. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. It just means that it's going to be running uphill some. Jesus put it this way in Matthew 7, verses 13 to 14. He said, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Jesus is saying in this text, It is tough to travel the, through the narrow gate and on this narrow path. The broad road, it's easy, and a lot of people travel it. And that is the direction of the world. But he said that's not the direction that he's calling us to walk. The anti-God atmosphere around us as Christians, 
The Bible refers to that as the world. And it's always pressing against us. It's always trying to cause us or force us to conform to it. In this paragraph that we're going to look at this morning, Peter focuses on giving his readers some encouragement to walk this walk, to to live a life that is holy. And the way he does it is he gives us some action steps. So I, I refer to them as five spiritual actions that will encourage his readers as well as us today to walk in holiness, to live in holiness. So let's jump in. The first of these action steps is to focus on Jesus' return. Focus on Jesus' return. Look what verse 13 says. It says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. The return of Jesus that Peter is talking about in this reference is a reference to hope. That's what he started the whole letter about, and he's continuing the theme just for a moment. He's saying that's really important. That should be the focus of your hope. Jesus promised this in John 14, 3, when he said, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. We have faith today that Jesus is going to return because he promised that he would. And as Christians, we should live in the future tense, not in the present tense, but the future tense, looking forward. We should live with an expectation that we are going to see Jesus soon. Now, when we have anticipation in our lives around something good and meaningful, there is an excitement that it motivates us. And it motivates us to live better, and it motivates us to work harder. You know what I'm talking about. It's the kid who decides a week before Christmas he's going to be good. Why? Because he knows Santa isn't going to come for a bad kid. A better example of that happened in our family a few, uh, several months back now. Natalie, our youngest daughter, got engaged early last year. And it set into motion a tremendous, tremendous movement of preparation and planning for this big wedding day. Now, it included dress shopping, and I get it. She wanted a dress that she felt good in and loved. I wanted a dress that we could afford, okay? So I was monitoring. I was there trying to say yes to the dress. I get it, okay? But then there was also cake testing. They did not invite me to that. The future groom was invited to cake testing, but the the future father-in-law who's paying for the cake didn't get invited. I felt like that was a tragic error, okay? And then I found out that there was also a lot of work that went into the hairstyle, okay? Now, I want to thank Brooke Wade, who who came up with this do. I thought that was a little overrated, with all due respect to Brooke. I mean, well, you get it. The guy with no hair doesn't see much value in this, right? There were a lot of things that we did, and we did all of this to turn this beautiful young woman right here, yeah, into this amazing, incredible, beautiful bride. And the anticipation actually led me to do some things that I would never do in any other moment for any other reason in my life. What am I talking about? I'm talking about this. That's right, dance lessons. Natalie decided she wanted to dance with her dad at her wedding reception, and so we took lessons in anticipation of that dance. And those lessons led me to taking lessons with my wife, who also decided that would be a good idea. So I was spending two nights a week for several months at dance lessons, and I am not proud of that. (laughs) And the only reason I did it was because we were anticipating this amazing day. This one, it's in a lifetime event, this huge wedding celebration. And we went through all of that so I could get one of these, a son-in-law. <laughs> kind of overrated, you know, all the work I put into it, I got that. <laughs> but if you look at how happy she is, I knew he was a good one. And he's been a great blessing to our family, and he's in here, so I kind of have to say that. <laughs> Tyler, is a great, he has been a great blessing. We love him very much. Anticipation can really change how we approach things, can it? 
And that's why Peter instructs us here to hold on to the hope that you have in Jesus and his promise that he's going to return. Here's how he recommends that you do this. Listen, listen to the words he uses there in verse 13. With minds that are alert and fully sober. Now, we know what alert, or alert means, but the word he uses there, sober, doesn't mean that you're not drunk. It means to be calm, steady, and controlled. What's interesting about this part of the text is that it's not a literal translation. The King James Version actually translates it literally, and this is what the King James says, gird up the loins of your mind. Now, what does that mean? Well, in Peter's time, people would often wear what we would call robes. These were garments that were really long. They went past the knee, probably just above the ankle. And if you were ever going to do any kind of running or any kind of physical labor, you would gird up your loins. You would grab the bottom of the back of your garment, your robe, and you would pull it up and you, you would tuck it into the leather belt that tied the whole outfit together so that you could move. That's the imagery that Peter is using here, and he's talking about it this way. He's saying, pull your thoughts together like that. Have a disciplined mind. Pull it all together. Peter's point is that when you center your thoughts on the return of Jesus, and you live your life accordingly, you're going to escape many of the worldly things that would impede your mind and obstruct your spiritual progress. We need to keep focused on Jesus. That's what Peter's saying here. We need to be focused on Jesus and his return. If we don't, then spiritually, something will happen like this. Boom. She was on her phone. She was not even aware. This is beautiful. She acts like nothing happened, right? Yeah, I meant to do that. Listen, she did not. But that's what happens. Just like that lady, if we're not paying attention, if we're not mindfully focused on Jesus, we can run the risk of crashing spiritually. Our outlook will determine our outcome. Our attitude determines our actions. As a Christian who's looking for the return of Jesus, we have a greater motivation to faithfully live for Jesus than the disciple who's not looking for his return. I love what Jonathan Edwards, one of the great evangelists of, of all time, said. He said, he was resolved never to do anything which I would be afraid to do if it were the last hour of my life. That's pretty good advice, if you think about it. The promise that Jesus is coming should encourage us to live holy and to not quit. Keep your eyes on the horizon. He's coming back. Well, the second action, spiritual action that Peter gives us to encourage us to live holy lives is to live by spiritual intelligence. Live by spiritual intelligence. Look what verses 14 and 15 say. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. The instruction that Peter is giving in this part of the text is logical and it's remarkably simple. Children inherit the nature of their parents. We pick up their behaviors, we pick up their habits, whether they're good habits or bad habits. We seem to kind of replicate those things in our lives, don't we? Well, what Peter is saying here is God is holy, therefore as his children, we should live holy lives also. In his second letter, Peter says, we may, so that we may participate in the divine nature. When we participate in his divine nature, we should reveal that nature through our lives, through godly living. Peter's reminding his readers of who they were before they came to know Christ. Don't ever forget where you came from, spiritually speaking. Paul kind of summarized all this in Ephesians, the second chapter, taking a, taking a picture of who we were before we came to know Christ. I love what he says. He says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. He's talking about Satan. You were under his authority. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. 
These first century Christians that Peter's writing to, they're a lot like us. They had been children of disobedience, but now they were children of God. And they were to be obedient to God as a result of being his children. True salvation always results in obedience to God. They had been imitators of the world. The word that Peter uses here is conforming to the standards of the world. They were, they were acquiescing, falling in line. They were on the broad road leading to destruction. It's interesting that the vast majority of unsaved people say that they want to be free and they want to be different, and yet they end up imitating the rest of the world. But we shouldn't be surprised because that's the nature That's the nature of the flesh. Peter points out that the cause for all of this is spiritual ignorance leads to indulgence. Spiritual ignorance leads to indulgence. If you don't know better, you will most likely move towards sin. It's your nature. And if you don't have understanding or knowledge, it will lead you to indulgence, because that's what ignorance does. It's the lowest common denominator. Unsaved people lack spiritual intelligence. That's not a knock on them. It's just that they don't don't have that understanding and they haven't embraced it if they've been given opportunity to know it. And this causes them to give themselves to all kinds of fleshly desires or worldly indulgences. Since we're born with a fallen nature, it's natural for us to want to live sinful lives. Our natural, our nature, excuse me, determines our appetites and our actions. You could illustrate it this way. Most, of, most people or a lot of people in our culture today have pets. They either have a dog or they have a cat. Those are the, probably the two most common pets, right? And yet, it's interesting, though they're household pets, a dog and a cat are really different from each other, aren't they? Why is that? Their behavior is different because their nature is different. It's just the natural way a dog is as opposed to a cat. Our original nature may be sinful, but we don't have to live like that. In fact, Peter says we're called to be holy. Look what he says in verse 15 again. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. Peter's point here is that Jesus calls us to live holy, and he is holy. The perfect example of holiness for us. He was holy. Peter says, so we should be holy. To a dedicated believer, there is no difference between a secular life and a sacred life. We don't have separate compartments for secular and sacred. We don't go, well, that's my job, that's secular, or that's my hobbies, that's secular, and, and that's, that's my church life, that's, that's uh, sacred, or that's my family life, that's sacred. To the, to the true follower of Jesus, it's all sacred, all of it. All of life is holy as we live to glorify God. So there's no you know, hall pass or anything like that where you can say, hey, I can do this because I do this. And this is separate from all this. It's not. It's all the same. It's all the same. It's all considered sacred. In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote that we are to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. If something cannot be done for the glory of God, then we can be pretty sure that it must be out of the will of God. And we shouldn't do it. We shouldn't do it. And that may mean that we get some spiritual intelligence. We're going to have to change some things. We're going to have to say no to some things. Because it's leading us away from holiness. It's leading us away from the example that Jesus gave us. All right, the third spiritual action that that, uh, Peter gives is probably my favorite one in this whole list. And that is obey the Bible. Obey the Bible. And I, I just love what the scripture does and the difference it can make in a person's life. And I guess that's why it resonates with me. Because I've seen the change that the word of God has made in my life and the lives of a lot of people. Listen to what he writes in verse 16. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Short verse. He's quoting Leviticus 11.44 here. And he uses the phrase, for it is written, which is kind of a signal it's, this is a statement that carries tremendous authority for the believer. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. 
In Luke, the fourth chapter, you read the story of Jesus, who is just, he has just spent 40 days in the desert. He's been fasting. And then the devil comes to tempt him. And Jesus responds to every temptation with the phrase, it is written, and then he quotes the scripture. Every time the, the devil levels a uh, temptation at him, he responds by saying, it is written, and then he quotes the scripture. And God defeated the devil on every one of his temptations. And you know what? We can do the same thing. With each temptation Jesus responded, we can refute the temptations that we face in the same manner. The Word of God defeated every single one of those temptations that the devil lobbed at Jesus. And Paul calls the Bible the sword of the Spirit. And we certainly see Jesus using it that way in this moment. But the Bible is not only a sword for spiritual battles, but it's also called a light that's given to us to guide us in a dark world. Listen to what the psalmist says in Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. Those who find meaning in God's word, those who will study it and, and they, will, they will find meaning and value in it. They meditate on that word and they seek to obey it and apply it to their lives. They will experience God's direction and blessing in their lives. If you don't believe that, try it. You'll be remarkably surprised. The Word reveals God's mind, and so we should learn it. It reveals God's heart, so we should love it. And it reveals God's will, so we should live that. Our whole being, our mind, our heart, and our will should be influenced by the Word of God. Now, the first step towards staying clean in a dirty, polluted world is to ask a simple question. What does the Bible say? If you face a certain situation, temptation, challenge, issue, whatever the circumstances, ask the question, what does the Bible say? You'd be surprised how often the Bible speaks directly to a specific issue. In the Word of God, we will find principles, promises, and people who give us godly guidance in the decisions that we have to face. And my advice to you is what Peter said to those who were struggling in northern Asia Minor. Obey the word. Obey the word. Especially as it applies to this issue of holiness. Well, there's a fourth, a fourth uh, encouragement that he gives us, spiritual action. And that is live with holy respect. Live with holy respect. Look what uh, verse, 18, or verse 17 says. Excuse me. He says, since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. And if you have the capacity to highlight, you should highlight reverent fear. As God's children, we need to be serious about sin, and we need to be dead serious about living holy lives out of reverent respect to God. God will not compromise when it comes to sin. He doesn't play around with it. He is loving and merciful and forgiving. But don't play games with sin, because he is also a righteous king who cannot permit his children to live in sin. After all, it was sin that sent his son Jesus to the cross. Peter talks about judgment here in verse 17. And the question, a lot of people get confused here. They want to, what's he talking about? What, when he talks about judgment, what's he talking about? He's referring to the judgment of a believer's works. The idea that God will judge each believer according to his actions is a repeated theme throughout the Bible. By talking about the judging of each man's work, Peter is not intending to nullify God's grace. In fact, this judgment has nothing to do with salvation, except that salvation ought to produce good works. It ought to produce holiness in the life of the believer. When we trusted Jesus with, our, with faith, we put our confidence, our faith, our trust in him. When we repented of our sins and confessed him as Lord, and when we were baptized into him, God forgave our sins, and he declared us righteous through his Son. Our sins were already judged on the cross. The blood of Jesus atoned for those sins. So when the Lord returns, 
there will be a judgment. He's going to judge our actions. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 14. He says this, For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. What's he saying there? Each of us will give an account of our works, of our actions, and each will receive the appropriate reward. So when the child of God obeys and he serves God in love, God makes a note of that. And he prepares the appropriate reward for that action. So when we think about this judgment of our actions, Peter says this at the end of verse 17. He says, therefore, live, he says, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. Peter's reminding his readers here that they're not from this place. They're foreigners. They're, another translation says strangers. I like that word better. They're strangers on this earth. And life is too short to waste with disobedience and sin. We should see God and say, you know what? You are so holy and you are so powerful and you have given so much for me that out of reverent fear and respect for you, I'm going to live my life as holy as I can by your power and by your strength. So live with holy respect. Live with reverent fear to the Lord Almighty. Well, that brings us to the fifth and final spiritual action. And this is probably the most important. Remember that God loves you. That's a simple truth, but never, ever, ever forget that. In 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and following, he says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. God's love for the believer is, without a doubt, the most significant reason for us to live holy lives. God loves you. How are you going to live? Peter reminded his readers of their salvation experience. All of us, all of us should regularly reflect and remember that God saved us too. Never forget that. This is a key reason why Jesus established the Lord's Supper, so that weekly his people would remember that he died for them on the cross. Peter gave his readers two key historical realities. He wants them to remember where they came from. And the first of those is he wanted to remind them of who they were, who, who they were once were. Excuse me, who they once were. At one time, they were slaves to sin who needed to be set free. Don't ever forget that. To us, the word redeemed is a theological word, right? I don't use the word redeemed very often. Uh, maybe if you take, you know, pop cans or pop bottles to a redemption center, you might redeem them. But I never use that. I hardly ever use that word, except in this context. But in the first century Roman Empire, this word had tremendous meaning. You think about it. There were approximately 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire at the, during the first century. And many of those slaves were Christians. A slave could purchase his or her own freedom, highly unlikely, but if they could collect enough funds to pay for their freedom, they could actually be set free. The other way that they could be, be set free was that their master could sell them to someone who would pay the price for them and then turn around and set them free. That was more likely to happen than them coming up with the amount of money. But this, this was called redemption. When someone paid a price so that you could be set free. And redemption was a prized thing in that day. You can imagine someone who once was a slave and now they're free because someone redeemed them, paid a price for them. You and I must never forget that we were also slaves to sin at one time. And we should never forget the cost that Jesus paid to redeem us and to pay for our freedom. 
Well, not only did they have a life of slavery to sin that he wanted them to remember, but there's also another historical reality here that he wanted to remind them of, and that was that they also lived a life of emptiness. Now, this is, this is interesting, I think. Peter called it the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. You know, some of us grew up in environments where we were taught to look out for number one, right? Please yourself. Do whatever makes you happy. The problem with that strategy for life is that it has no real meaning to it. It's what Peter would call empty. And it always leads to trouble. And it always leads to disappointment, at the end anyway. Jesus came so that we might have life and it might be full. He said, I came that you might have life and you might have it to the fullness. It has meaning. It has real substantive purpose to it. Peter didn't want them to continue to live in that emptiness. Don't live that way. There's a far better way. He not only reminded his readers of who they were, but he also reminded them of what Jesus did for them. Jesus shed his precious blood to purchase us out of slavery to sin and to set us free forever. That term redeemed that we were just talking about, it means to set someone free by paying a price. Now a slave, a slave could be set free with the payment of money, but here's the reality. There is not enough money that could set a sinner free. You can't pay enough. You can't. You could, be the, you could be the Bill Gates or the Warren Buffetts of the world, and you could combine those, those fortunes together, and you could add a couple Saudi princes in there, and you could get all of that money together, and it's not enough. It's not enough, because the price for your sin was the pure and spotless blood of a lamb. Only the blood of Jesus can redeem a sinner of their sins. When when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he pointed him out. And this is what he said. He said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That was prophetic. But Jesus would eventually go three, three and a half years later and die on the cross. He was the Lamb of God. Peter made it crystal clear that Jesus' death was not an accident. He laid down his life for sinners, and he was raised from the dead. And now anyone who puts their trust and faith in him will be saved for all eternity. And he did this because he loved you. That's why he did it. And that's the greatest reason to live a holy life. Because God spared the most important thing to him, his own son, so that you would be you would know how valued you are to him. Your sins would be washed away. The best reason of all to live holy. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for loving us, for sending Jesus to give his life to, to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. God, you put your own son there on the cross and his blood now is the price that was paid to redeem us from our sins. And all we can say, God, is from hearts that are filled with gratitude, thank you, thank you. You gave us so much when you gave us Jesus. Lord, help us to change our hearts so that we would live holy lives motivated with the desire to bless you back. We know we can't be perfect, but we know that as we live, we can glorify you by the way that we live. Lord, in our imperfections, will you help us to live holy? Lord, help Peter's words to encourage us to action. We know life isn't easy. I know there's some who've limped in here today but spiritually, maybe emotionally, maybe even physically, life has just been pounding on them. I pray, God, that you would give them an extra measure of confidence that this life is only for a moment. Eternity is forever. And you're going you're gonna to make a difference in their life. 
Help us, God, to be lights that shine brightly in this world, that people will see that we're different. We're different because we're living like Jesus to the best that we can. Lord, we're not better than others. We're just different, different in a good way. Help us to live this life expecting Jesus' return at any minute, and may that impact how we live. God, help us to give you our very best. I praise you for this reminder today. God, we love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm not sure where you're at in your life. Some of you, I know, this, you got some challenging news this week. The doctor said, hey, I'm not sure, but it doesn't look good, and so you're going to have tests, or maybe you're in a relationship and things have been choppy all along for the last several months, and, and now you're wondering, maybe it's not going to work out. I saw a guy this morning I was with on Friday night, and I asked him, how's it going? And he just shook his head. It's not good. His marriage is falling apart. Wherever you're at, whatever the pressure is, the advice Peter gave to these churches in northern Asia Minor was to keep going on, even in the face of persecution, even in the face of struggle. And I want to encourage you to do the same. Keep fighting the good fight, walking the path that is narrow through that narrow gate, but know that God is with you. He's going to see you through this. Let's give him our very best. And maybe you've never taken that step of faith. You've been doing life the way you want to do it. I want to invite you to take Jesus up on his offer. That he'll forgive you of your sins if you surrender your life to him. He'll give you eternity in heaven with him. All you have to do is trust him. Put your heart in his hands. I'm going to be right down here to your right. I'd love to talk to you if you want to talk more about that or if you just need somebody to pray with you. I'll be down there. I'd love to to do that. Let's stand together and let's worship our King.